by virtue of the fact that consciousness happens in the universe, consciousness is, is definitely mathematical and it's woven mm -hmm. up. It, it's, um, it's tied up with this grand mathematical fabric of reality as well. Yeah. But there's this idea that, of, that consciousness isn't merely mathematical by virtue of the trivial fact that it exists within you know, the mathematical apparatus of reality, but mm -hmm. that, that, that consciousness is what breathes fire into the mathematics of reality. This mm -hmm. I love. This is an idea that I am uh, deeply interested in and committed to. You are a very interesting person. <laughs> so, <laughs> just looking much. over Google, you left uh, breadcrumbs all over the internet that I found really fascinating. <laughs> so it sounds like you already founded a company at a very young age. Yeah, you way back. Gave, way back already. Wow, you gave a <laughs> TED Talk. Also which way back. <laughs> is way back also, which is very impressive. And then also stuck out to me, it sounds like you published something in the Scientific American about three years ago, where yes. you voiced some concern about the beta amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's, which of course yes. now you got vindicated and everybody knows that the data doesn't seem to hold up. There was fraud in the back of it. So three years ago, uh, it seems like <laughs> you already were correct. Is, so all of this, all of that is true. Uh, all of those breadcrumbs are correct. Yeah. So so yeah. So I, I worked on this um, sensor for Alzheimer's patients, inspired by by my grandpa, um, back in like the 2013 to 2016 era, um, and then uh, left essentially left work on that to pursue um, Alzheimer's research uh, and also just go to college uh, between 2016 and 2020. Um, and when I was working on Alzheimer's research, I was working on this hypothesis, which is not mine, uh, to be clear, but it's, it's a hypothesis that amyloid beta developed as an antimicrobial peptide. So amyloid beta, as people might know, um, is this protein that um, is linked to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, amyloid beta plaques tend to be found in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. Um, and uh, yeah, the idea is that amyloid beta might actually not be... Um, the, uh, the amyloid beta might actually serve a protective function um, in the immune system um, as essentially a, a peptide that, that fights against bacteria and other kinds of pathogens that are harmful to the body. Um, so that was, that, was a, that was an idea that I worked on. Um, and uh, yeah, I've always been uh, skeptical about amyloid beta just because we've developed so many drugs you know, for targeting amyloid mm -hmm. beta in various different ways that haven't worked. Um, uh, and that's skepticism that I think has been shared by a number of other um, scientists as well. Um, but yeah, this uh, this antimicrobial peptide thing is uh, something that I that I stopped pursuing and and you know since started working on on psychedelics and, and consciousness. Um, but but it is I think a, a hypothesis that, that merits uh, further research. Yeah, so maybe we should talk about it. So because all of that is amazingly impressive for a life's work. But if I understand correctly, you're currently working as a graduate student. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So you're just right. starting out on your scientific career. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm a, I'm a PhD student um, at Oxford right now, um, working with uh, Morten Kringlebach on psychedelics and their effects on the brain. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing there? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I just started this line of research um, about a year ago. Um, so over the last year, I've been working on this meta-analysis um, of the scientific literature, the neuroscientific literature on psychedelics which tries to relate three different hierarchical levels of analysis for understanding psychedelics. The first is pharmacology. So in other words, the receptors that psychedelics bind to in the brain, you know, serotonin receptors, dopamine receptors, adrenaline receptors. Um, that's one level of the hierarchy. The, the next level above that is neuroimaging. So what we can detect with fMRI, um, you know, regions in the brain that essentially light up when you take psychedelics. Um, and then at the top of the hierarchy, we have the phenomenology or the subjective experience. And that's the feeling of ego death um, the feeling of uh, interconnectedness and so on. So if we want to understand the effects of psychedelics in the brain, we have to relate these three hierarchical levels of analysis together. Um, and that's what the meta-analysis um, tries to, to begin to do. Um, so that's what I've been working on for a large part of the last year. The other thing that I'm really interested in is this um, idea that psychedelics um, change entropy, the amount of entropy in the brain. Um, so there's this uh, idea from Robin Carr Harris um, that uh, psychedelics um, increase entropy in the brain and that this increase in entropy corresponds to um, the subjective experience of psychedelics, the mm -hmm. ego death and, and so on and so forth. Um, and 
Entropy is, is closely linked to this idea of irreversibility and the error of time. So if you have, um, for example, if you um, smash an egg on the floor, um, you increase entropy. And the way you know you increase entropy is that that's a highly irreversible process. If I were to film a video of you smashing an egg and flip it backwards, you could clearly tell that the backward, you know, which, which direction is backwards, which direction is forwards. Whereas if I were to show you like a pendulum swinging, um, which is very reversible, um, that's, a, that's a process that doesn't produce much entropy. So I'm, I'm trying to see basically whether or not the, whether or not psychedelics um, increase the amount of irreversibility um, mm -hmm. in the brain um, or decrease the amount of irreversibility. And, and the preliminary findings so far is that psychedelics decrease the amount of irreversibility, mm -hmm. um, uh, which suggests that, that um, in other words, if you were to uh, take brain signals and flip them backwards, that the uh, backwards brain signals would look more similar to, to the forward brain signals. So that's, that's, um, that's what I've been working on so far and um, still got another two years left. Yeah. Do you um, mostly collect data that exists already, or do you put people in the scanner and you give them psychedelics? Yeah, good question. I do not put any people in the scanner yet. Um, I'd like to do that at some point, but uh, at the moment, we're just analyzing data that comes from Imperial. Great, great, interesting. And of course, it seems to me that uh, one thing we haven't mentioned yet, which is what really got me interested in you, is that you also have a blog. Um, it's on yeah. blankhorizons.com, so we'll link that down there as well. Yeah. And it sounds to me that uh, you have this deep interest in consciousness that mm. precedes your PhD. Is that correct? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but it's, it also sounds to me that you manage to, uh, a lot of things that you talk about in this blog and your, your take on consciousness or the, the particular aspects that you're interested, they now, they, they jive very well with what you're doing um, with psychedelics and, and entropy. Yeah, and yeah, 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 absolutely. Now, I, I've been interested in, in consciousness for a very long time. Um, I, I, I first started thinking about this when I read this book called The Power of Now by mm -hmm. Eckhart Tolle. Um, six years ago, and that completely changed my life. And it, it introduced me to this idea of consciousness as, you know, this direct experience of the present moment, but that if you somehow manage to, to zoom your consciousness out of your mind and just into this pure direct experience of the present moment, then you can relieve your suffering um, and, um, you can feel more connected to your true self and to the world and and, and so on. Um, so uh, so that was like a sort of more more spiritual and philosophical view on consciousness. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I come from a, a family of scientists um, and from a scientist background. So mm -hmm. I've all, all I've also always really been interested in understanding um, how consciousness and the brain are linked. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it struck me that that these two, um, different camps of consciousness were not really talking to each other. You have the neuroscientists on the one hand, mm. you have some people who, you know, just believe that if you, you know, put people to sleep or you put people, on, put, put people under anesthesia, then you can understand, you know, what brain regions mediate that change. And then boom, you have an understanding of consciousness and that's it. Um, so you have the neuroscientists, and then, and then also you have some neuroscientists who, who believe that there's a lot more to the picture, but um, who still believe that you, know, you, you can just look at the neuroscience and that's it. Um, and then on the other side, you have um, these the spiritual teachers from a wide variety of different spiritual traditions um, who believe that you know, consciousness is the inherent nature of the universe, um, uh, that, uh, that consciousness extends beyond the brain um, and within there too, you have, you have differences. You have, you know, um, people like, uh, Rupert Spira, who, um, is, who is in the non, non, non-dual, um, spiritual school. Uh, and, and, you know, he, yeah. So, so for him, like consciousness is, um, yeah, consciousness is the essence of everything. Um, but he's sort of just like, you know, he, he has that philosophical view, but then you have other people who think that like, you know, because consciousness is the inherent nature of the universe, then you can do things like telepathy, you know, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So, so within the spiritual um, traditions, you also do have uh, a, a broad variety. But the, the key idea is that these two different camps of consciousness were not talking to each other enough. That was, that was um, my main observation. The neuroscientists were not talking to the spiritual teachers enough. 
but that somewhere in between these two things, between neuroscience and spirituality, we can find this marriage of two worlds and really understand consciousness. And I really believe that you needed both um, to, to get there. And it struck me that there were basically two tools that we could use for, for unifying these two different uh, ways of seeing consciousness. And those are psychedelics and meditation. Um, because you can uh, get people to meditate in a brain scanner and see uh, the effects that that has on their brain. And similarly, you can take people to get psychedelics under a brain scanner and see what effects that, that has on their brain. Um, and then between these two options, I think psychedelics are actually the um, preferred choice. The reason being that meditation is an extremely ambiguous thing. There are so many different types of meditation, mantra mm -hmm. meditation, focused attention meditation, loving kindness meditation. Um, uh, and you know, there's no such thing as the chemical structure of meditation. We don't know, you know, whether or not meditation quote unquote binds to serotonin receptors in the brain, mm -hmm. whereas with something like psychedelics, it has a very clear chemical structure. We actually know exactly which receptors it binds to in the brain. Uh, and, um, and, 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 you know, you also do see, um, fairly consistent changes in the brain, um, when mm -hmm. people go under an fMRI scanner and take psychedelics. Um, so that's why I, I started studying psychedelics as, as I think a, a window into consciousness. And it's not necessarily, uh, it, it won't necessarily tell us everything, but I think it certainly does tell us a lot. And it tells us a lot more than, you know, going to sleep or going under anesthesia mm -hmm. where, you know, conscious goes, just goes off. Um, you could argue that consciousness in a way uh, turns even more on <laughs> under psychedelics, depending on how you see it. Um, but certainly you get a much richer set of changes to a person's state of consciousness when they take psychedelics mm -hmm. than when you just, you know, go under anesthesia. Yeah, you said a lot of very interesting things there. So um, maybe let's take it from the beginning. So yes, I think the, I think you, it seems to me you're way ahead of the time. So somebody who has a long standing history, maybe even with the neuroscience of consciousness, it seemed to me that it was so hard to convince anybody that we can study consciousness in the first place yes. that basically we started out by doing this consciousness on off. So how much consciousness, when does it begin? When does it end? And of course there's still so many unopened questions, but what might argue that the biggest breakthroughs we had in a field where in diagnosing coma, finding patients that were diagnosed as comatose, but actually had some consciousness. Yeah. Practically speaking, these those were big breakthroughs. And the last couple of years, I think they saw a shift that I find particularly intriguing, where we're not just looking at the amount of consciousness or are the lights on or the lights off, mm -hmm. but what is consciousness actually like? So the, right, the right. content, the, exactly. the qualia, as exactly. philosophers yes. call it. Yes, and yes. So it seems that you both from a philosophical perspective, as well now from experimental perspective, you're one of the people that are really digging into that. And so from somebody who has a neuroscientific point of view, some of it might sound a little scary, as you said, when it veers into telepathy or things that- Right, um, right, exactly, yeah. I usually the new see age really, stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but then the interesting development I feel in this field right now is that to tie this exploration of contents of consciousness to mm -hmm. rigor, so mm -hmm. that yeah. there's this mathematical formalism. There are theories that are both yeah. quantitative and qualitative. And so we're, in a way, we're doing the opposite of mm -hmm. what somebody might be worried about in terms yeah. of merging science with pseudoscience, but right. taking uh, consciousness quite seriously on a, on a scientific level as well. Yes. yes. And, and so maybe that allows us to then explore some of, as you said, these, these uh, already existing mm -hmm. phenomenological explorations of first person perspective data. Yeah. Yeah. What do absolutely. you think of that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting question. So I, I think it's useful uh, to distinguish between three different ways of, of seeing consciousness. One is seeing consciousness as an on-off switch, which I think is mm -hmm. definitely way too reductive. Then there's a contents of consciousness is the second thing. And the third thing is the states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, so I think contents of consciousness are a little bit difficult to grapple with because um, it's... Anything can be, uh, you know, an object uh, or can form a part of the content of your consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, there is um, the conscious experience of seeing a table. Um, there's a conscious experience of seeing an apple. There's a conscious experience of, you know, breathing the fresh air. These are all different um, objects of consciousness. Um, and, you know, you could definitely train some kind of a machine learning classifier 
you know, do some multivariate pattern analysis to find out the, you know, regions of the brain um, that, uh, you know, encode these different experiences. Um, but at the end of the day, what does that really tell us about consciousness? If I, if I, if I can tell you the brain signature of, you know, every single imaginable content of consciousness, you know, every fruit, every painting you'll ever see, right? What, what does that actually tell us? You, de- you get a bunch of different neural signatures. Is there any consistency across people? You know, um, is there anything that we can generalize from that? It's a little bit unclear to me. States of consciousness are also very mysterious because, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to know exactly when something goes from being just an object of consciousness to a state of consciousness. Um, I guess by states of consciousness, I mean things like, for example, um, ego death or interconnectedness um, mm-hmm. or, or a, a dissolution of the sense of the body. You know, mm-hmm. those are changes in, in a person's state of consciousness, and they r- relate to more global structural features of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think those can also, those, those can be more illuminating because, yeah, again, you understand these more holistic properties of consciousness. Mm. Um, uh, but it's also, it's also very hard to know um, how exactly to quantify these things, because, mm. again, where a, where a state starts and where a state ends, it's, uh, it's very unclear. Now, this is very interesting in the skeptic in me wants to push back and yeah. it sounds that what you see in different states of consciousness are all extraordinary states of consciousness that somebody yes. like me might not even have experienced yet. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. 100%, 100%. So how do you deal with that? I guess the criticism would be that, well, while I might not have achieved these kind of things using a high uh, practice level of meditation yeah. or using psychedelics, uh, I've been drunk, for example, so I know yeah. what it is like to be intoxicated and to maybe mistake um, levels of inter- intoxication as yeah. something more profound or, or state-wise. Yes. So yes. H- how, how would you answer that kind of skepticism? Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. So, I mean, you're right that everything that I've spoken about is an extraordinary state of consciousness, but there are many ordinary states of consciousness too. For example, you know, some mornings you may wake up and you may feel more dissociated or you may feel more in touch with the world, you know? Mm. Um, and, and you could say that that's a, a, a global state of consciousness. Now, you know, the, the skeptic might try to just say, well, you know, this just relates to, you know, um, the feeling of arousal, right? And, mm. and, uh, and, you know, you can, and, and clearly we have all these different neurophysiological neurophysi- signatures of arousal and, and things like that, um, which, 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 may, which, which may certainly be true. Um, but point being, I mean, even also, you know, sleep and anesthesia, those are also um, uh, mm. different states of consciousness too, mm. um, when, when the switch turns off. Yeah, that's really fair. I think that the dream state, as you said, that's one of the mm, yeah. many things where neuroscience seems to have a blind spot, right? So there's yeah. almost no research on that whatsoever. And that's a state yeah. that almost all of us experience every night. So yeah. I think that's a really fair point. Now, yeah, yeah. There's another thing you mentioned that I want to hark back on, which I found really interesting. So you said that what launched this for you was Eckhart Tolle, who is seen as a little bit new agey, new agey. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah he is. But you said that, it, so I guess just reading the book, you, you wrote on your blog that you had yeah. this immediate experience of having a more profound experience. I think you said that yeah. you experienced a moment of much more rich and you were much more yeah. aware of everything yeah. that was around you by letting go of the, the past yeah. and, the, and the future. Now, um, of course, some of these things, they um, also come from people that or you hear from people that meditate or people that come uh, maybe from more of a eastern spiritual tradition let's say buddhism and you write about that as well so i'm I'm interested what what came first the chicken or the egg Uh, so was it Eckhart Tolle who made you aware of that or were you also aware of those other traditions or you got interested in those after the fact yeah so i had no awareness whatsoever of any of the the, you know the, the the background um spiritual ideas um, that informed and are present in, in Eckhart's work. I, I read Eckhart Tolle's book for the first time, um, and I was completely blown away because it was all so new to me. Um, I'd never heard any of the ideas in there before. Uh, and, you know, I, um, yeah, so I, I came from, you know, a family of academics, um, went to uh, a prep school in New York, and, um, you know, my entire life had been focused on uh, cultivating the mind um and uh when i read the power of now for the first time i remember having this moment where like i sat at my desk and it felt like i was feeling the you know uh, entire lower half of my body for the first time <laughs> hmm. everything everything you know below my head um hmm. 
uh, you know, like I could, I could feel, for example, like my arms sitting on the armrest, my feet touching the floor. You know, I just, I just became so much more perceptive of, of the hmm. present moment. And do you meditate? Have you have had has that gotten you in in exploring these kind of clips? Because you do write about yeah. them on your blog as well. I do, I do meditate. I I, I try to meditate every day. Um, I've I've tried a number of different traditions. I did standard mindfulness for for a number of years. Um, and now have moved into more um, Taoist uh, uh, types of meditation centered around letting go of energy blockages in your body. So it sounds to me as somebody who has no experience in these things, one thing that I think is intriguing is that many people that have a long practice of meditation or that, that yeah. try psychedelics, it does seem that these are life changing experiences very yes. often so yes uh, so from an outside perspective at least you can see that there seems to be a there there that that yeah. a lot of people including you know very rigorous scientists that uh, they say that for example for a lot of people it seems that their fear of death disappears yeah. or that uh yes their thinking on how we tackle consciousness even neuroscientifically has altered profoundly so 100%. yeah so that's interesting so but um for somebody who's interested in that, do you think that I should read The Power of Now? Do you think I should try to meditate? Uh, would there be a, a quick path towards, um, you know, getting to those kinds of insights or experiences? Yeah, definitely, yes. I do think that the the paths tend to be very slow. Um, so, for example, I've been meditating five years now, okay. and I've found that it's a very, very nonlinear process. Um <laughs> The path has a lot of twists and curves in it. And, you know, I mean, like, I think, I think meditation teachers try to warn people against this notion of making progress in meditation. Uh, hmm. But I, I don't think I've, I've actually made progress in meditation necessarily. Um, hmm. uh, it's still very easy for my mind to get caught up on itself and, and to spend most of my time in meditation thinking rather than uh, getting in touch with the present. But nonetheless, I mean, uh, it's, certainly been a very valuable experience for me it's, it's taught me uh, a lot about consciousness um mm. and in, in particular about like awareness of the body mm. so i would definitely definitely recommend it very interesting now um you we met at this conference that is about the mathematics yes. of consciousness so yes. what draws you to that new approach yeah so three years ago i interned for this place called the qualia research institute um which is a, a non-profit research organization dedicated to the science of consciousness and they are very interested in um, meditation and, and psychedelics and these extraordinary altered states of consciousness. Um, and they're interested uh, in, in using very rigorous mathematical tools to model these things. Um, so they have this idea um, called qualia formalism, which is this idea that, that you can uh, create a mathematical formalism um, that accounts for consciousness. And this is a really interesting idea to me. Um, and uh, and you know, when I got to Oxford, I found out about this uh, organization called OMCAN, which stands for the Oxford Mathematics of Consciousness and Applications Network. Um, and, and through that, and it was because of that that you know, I ended up coming to this conference uh, hmm. on the math of consciousness. So are you, are you associated with that center? Do you work with I am, yes. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm on one of their committees. And so I think this is what our interests really deeply overlap. So you on your blog, you you write a lot about that and um, mm. you touch on on quantum physics as well, which is I think yeah. that the other people at Oxford that do that as well. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that the question is if we if we get to that level, if we can describe um, yeah. the I guess this would be more about the content of consciousness, right? So you come yeah. up with a mathematical description of the content. Yeah. or would you include states as well? Yes, yeah, definitely include states too. Okay, that's interesting. And so those would be some kind of mathematical construct that we're hoping that we could get to. Yeah. And of course, for me as a neuroscientist, that's a very exciting idea because yeah. if we can also come up with similar mathematical constructs of brain activity, then there's certain ideas in math that would say that we could translate one to the other. Yes. And of course, that would be the holy grail that yes. uh, we can read our brain activity and we can somehow get to the content of the consciousness that that yeah. brain produces. Yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think um, while in principle, there is definitely a mathematical formalism for consciousness, it is probably extremely difficult to identify. 
Um, for instance, um, there's no mathematical formalism of a cell. Um, we have a lot of understanding now of the biological processes that you know happen in cells. But there's a lot going on there. And if you try to unify all these things together into a neat set of equations, it's going to be very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. I don't know that anybody's actually accomplished that yet. Um, yeah. Uh, and for a lot of areas in neuroscience, there's no, uh, there isn't really an attempt to make a mathematical formalism out of them. Mm -hmm. For example, we also really understand sleep pretty well, mm -hmm. um, but, but nobody's really trying to come up with a mathematical formalism of sleep. I think the reason why people are trying to come up with a mathematical formalism of consciousness is because it's such a mysterious thing and mm -hmm. it's so hard to quote unquote experimentally test um, mm -hmm. that people are drawn to um, finding something um, very rigorous. Um, mm -hmm. and tying it to consciousness. Um, so um, I was initially very, I think, gung-ho about this idea of, of identifying a mathematical formalism of consciousness. So I thought more about it. I've, I've become a bit more dissuaded. And mm -hmm. the, second, the second more fundamental issue is that, um, uh, is that there is no clear way for how to identify the mapping between subjective experience mm -hmm. and um, the mathematical formalism of consciousness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, for example, um, let's say I come up with a um, uh, mathematical structure for consciousness. You know, um, let's say, for example, you know, it, it, it could be any any kind of mathematical object. You know, like a set or um, you know something that has like a topological structure. Anything, right? How do I know that that actually encodes consciousness, right? Maybe I can say, okay, here are some basic phenomenological axioms of consciousness, um, you know, self-awareness, um, uh, the fact that consciousness is unified, et cetera, et cetera. So you have these phenomenological axioms, and then you have like the, the sort of like mathematical, um, uh, the, yeah, the mathematical postulates, as they might say in IIT, or just like this mathematical object. How, how are these things, two things connected? There's actually no way to know. Um, the best thing that you can do scientifically is um, still just behavior. Um, somebody reports that they are awake or I guess they can't report that they're unconscious, but they report that they're awake or they report different con contents of consciousness. And, you know, your theory has some kind of prediction about, you know, which mathematical structures underlie that. And then, then, then you get some a validation there. Um, but, but fundamentally we actually don't have a way of interrogating what this mapping is. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that I see is a big problem in the field. Um, and can I, can I jump yeah, in there? Really yeah, quick? absolutely. So absolutely. You actually you, yeah. ha had something on your blog that I found very inspiring in yeah. that sense, which is that you, you wrote about quantum physics. And so I'm not an expert in, in quantum Neither physics, I, to be clear. but you, you, you grab, you had some really interesting stuff and you grabbed a particular cartoon that really, uh, sprung out to me where I think you're going all the way back to the standard model where, um, basically it's math that starts yeah. it all, right? So you have symmetry right. groups like SO3 and so on. Right, right, right. And we can then translate um, these particles and their behavior into matrices or wave functions, equivalent. Yes. And in the end, we can do an experiment. And so to me, it seems that there's a similar problem right here, which is that we do not really know how reality or the world or these particles really relate to those mathematical constructs. Yes. Yes. But we use these mathematical constructs. And then also there's the other problem that in the end, we just have these uh, measure, measured observables. So yeah. what, what we get out of all of this math is something that seems much more pedestrian and banal and right. maybe even disappointing. So the actual measurement is much less exciting. But in a way, it reminds me of maybe what this field might be headed towards as well. That So we can measure things, but we can describe the conscious uh, content or states mathematically, and it, it might be similarly abstract and similarly non-graspable and similarly miraculous. But then when you measure, so you, you do behavior, you do reports, these kind of things, it breaks yeah. it down to something that's almost banal. But the, the it would still maybe, I, I want to avoid the were proof, but it would still kind of hint at the fact that the math that we used to describe it, such as in quantum theory, mm -hmm. is valid or is useful, I should maybe say, in the sense that yeah. it can describe how we end up with these observables. Yes. Uh, yes. What do you think of that line of thought? I, I think that's 100% correct. Um, and I, I think that the main problem is the difficulty in identifying the formalism. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, certainly, you're right that um, you, know, uh, you can 
uh, in general, construct mathematical theories about the world um, and have those theories validated by making falsifiable predictions. Mm. Um, uh, I, I think that when you try to um, go up many, many scales from quantum particles um, to human brains, mm. it's really difficult. Um, mm. uh, and secondly, um, you can only experimentally, so, so, right. So you can make falsifiable predictions, uh, about, you know, the physical world, right. And, and test those with experiments. What are falsifiable predictions when it comes to the science of consciousness? Falsifiable mm. predictions are at the moment really only predictions that can be uh, affirmed or denied on the basis of verbal reports. Mm. Um, and, uh, um, that, yeah, that, that's the only way to know whether or not somebody actually is conscious of something or is not conscious of something. Mm. The other possibility was something that was raised at the conference, which I think was to me really interesting, which is like, um, which is that, that the theory predicts that there is some change in the dynamics of the, you know, uh, of the physical substrate of consciousness. Mm. So let's say, for example, if somebody undergoes a change in their state of consciousness, um, that, you know, they feel uh, more interconnected, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. And they don't report that either because it's subtle or they don't know how to put it into words or something. Um, uh, but there's a very concrete prediction made about how the dynamics of their brain will change. That's mm -hmm. not a direct test of consciousness because again, the only direct test of consciousness can come from the person himself or herself. Um, but it, it's like a sort of, I guess, like second order falsifiable prediction, if, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, what do you think another maybe third way out would be to accept first person science and yeah. basically 100%. just say uh, n equals one. And so you for yourself, you know your consciousness and yeah. you could start exploring your brain. You could do, I guess, uh, meditation and psychedelics in a way would be that, right? So you mm -hmm. can do experiments with your own consciousness and in, in, in those cases, manipulate your brain and then mm -hmm. see what that does. Yes, and, absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, so, so you're not an opponent to allowing for an N equals one first person science. Absolutely. I, I, I am a big uh, staunch advocate of uh, first person experience. Um, and I think, I think we have to rely on first person reports in order to advance the science of consciousness. Definitely. Yeah. So the, what, what I always like to bring up is that uh, Gedak experiment of there's a single survivor on, on planet earth, just one human yeah. being. And that yeah. happens to be a brilliant scientist who is yeah. also interested in consciousness and yeah. so there would be no more it wouldn't make sense anymore to even rely on behavioral report or uh, yeah. any kind of communication but we would probably still accept that whatever brilliant science this person would produce would still be good science so yes. um to me that yes. thought experiment shows that maybe that hard criterion that we seem to have on the intersubjective in yeah. science may be a little too strong. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. And, and I, I mean, I think, I think uh, as a separate point to this, um, the, the problem with first person reports of, of consci consciousness is not that they are not true because there is a certain sense in which, I, I think in philosophy, this might be called like the assertoric force uh, of, of, of subjective reports. Um, if somebody says they're in pain, they are definitely in pain. Like mm. there, there's, there's, there's no two ways about it. You know, like somebody mm. experiences a burning sensation in their arm and it's definitely there. Obviously you get to more ambiguous situations where, you know, um, people have a really difficult time, for example, assessing whether or not they feel happy. Um, um, mm. but the reason I say that is that, um, the, the difficulty with subjective reports is not that they're not true, it's that people are not trained to introspect into um, the contents and the state of their consciousness. Mm. If you put somebody on an fMRI scanner and you try to uh, correlate their subjective ratings or their subjective reports with their uh, brain activity, it would be impossible because most people, if you sat them in an fMRI scanner, you see all these things happening in their brain. And then after 10 minutes of these crazy things happening in their brain, all they say is, yeah, I felt fine, you know, <laughs> mm. like, uh, it, it, like it, it, the problem is that we, we don't, unless you meditate um, or you, or you undergo some kind of intensive training and introspection, um, you don't uh, have the ability to report fine grained subtle changes in mm. your conscious experience. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. So to me, a lot of the discussion in the feed reminds me of discussions surrounding psychophysics, yes. which to me is, is a forgotten branch of psychology in that psych 
physics was meant to do all of these things. It was meant yeah. to get at consciousness, to be scientific about it, rigorous about it. And uh, Fechner and Weber, when they discovered their first mathematical laws that can describe yes. uh, conscious content in a way, they yeah. got so excited. And in that field, it is this, there's the same notion that a really good psychophysics paper should mm -hmm. probably include the authors because yeah, yeah. they are trained observers. So there's this whole notion of, as you said, that when it comes to psychophysics, that things are subtle and yeah. they're easy to miss. And somebody who does these things repeatedly hundreds and thousands of times will be better at reporting those. Yeah. And um, yes. So you, you're saying the same thing uh, basically should happen in this new branch. And, and I'm, I'm mentioning that because doing it practically, I do run into issues with ethics boards <laughs> and yeah, yeah. try to explain why it is okay to uh, introduce first, uh, yeah, I guess it would be first person data, but even author yeah. data into a uh, paper and how psychophysics yeah. managed mm -hmm. to come up with techniques so that even if you are your own research subject, you're blind to what yeah. the experimental conditions are. Right. And, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah so yeah. you can't cheat quite as easily. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting you mentioned Fechner, actually, because uh, I was just reading about, you know, Fechner and, and Weber's law um, the other day, actually, right before I came to the conference. And um, I, I really like Weber's paradigm. Um, it's something that's uh, very similar to um, uh, what QRI has been interested in as an approach to studying consciousness, and that approach is these just noticeable differences, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like, like uh, there are all these fine-grained differences in color that you probably couldn't detect consciously. But, you know, if you, you know, let's say you have these RGB values, right? Um, and you increase one of the, one of the values by one, you, you don't see anything consciously, but you increase it by five, then you see something. And that's a just noticeable difference. Um, and that's interesting because like, it's a, it's a quote unquote, like objective criterion of consciousness, right? Like um, you can, you can get a cut and dry answer, yes or no, from somebody about whether or not they perceive a difference in their consciousness. But that's very different from, you know, the question of how do you feel? Um, um, or what did you experience when you were on the psychedelic, for example? Um, and that's the kind of thing where, where you, you, you need to train people, I think, to, to become more introspective. Exactly. It seems to me that it's almost an extension of psychophysics, what's going on, and that psychophysics was only about the how much or right, yeah. probing the, the, even the structure, maybe mathematically. So when you, you mentioned color perception, right? So you can do yeah. this for all of these different colors and you can come up with a color space and it's three-dimensional and it's yes. distorted um, because of how our perception works. But that just seems like a first step and yep. it's cut short because you're only asking, was the difference yes or no? And you're just looking at magnitude, basically. Exactly, exactly, and, yes, and, yes. And so what's happening now seems to, to really take things into structure. And there, there's new experimental techniques that seem to be more uh, lend themselves to that, so just the yeah. similarity measurements and, and just throwing things into multidimensional spaces. Right, um, right. But yeah, so psychophysics in a way already paved the way, but it, it's, it stopped short. It's, mm -hmm. I don't know if you if you explored Fechner. I actually because I got interested, in that, I explored his writings. And if you go on YouTube, you can see he was a prolific writer, and mm. he must have been quite an eccentric character. So he has yeah. uh, dozens upon dozens of really really bizarre and weird books that nobody knows about oh, and cool. talks about about um, theories of what the moon might be made of and so on. So wow. uh, very interesting so character. You mentioned wow. somebody okay. else that you said uh, is interested um, in those kind of questions. Yeah, QRI. Yeah, they're, 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 they're very interested in this. And I, I, they were the, one who, the ones who introduced me to this idea of color spaces, you know, that you can form from, from just noticeable differences in color. And that's, you know, the subjective color space as opposed to the physical color space. Um, uh, and, you know, the question is, can you do this for other types of mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. subjective experience. QRI is interested in doing this for smell, for example. Ah, mm -hmm. um, smell is an extremely hard space to map because supposedly there are like a trillion different smells that, that the human beings are capable of smelling. Um, and our noses also just aren't as well trained as our eyes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, Andres, the director of research at QRI, is, has actually been uh, really trying to train himself to, to get better at smelling <laughs> um, uh, and inventing new kinds of odors as well. Um, over the past several years. Very interesting. Yeah, it's actually something I dabble in as well. For me, smell is an interesting modality since yeah. it seems to be, um, it, it seems to be more easy to be synesthetic with it yeah. in the sense that yeah. if I say this is a blue smell or um, a yellow yeah. smell, oh, it seems that people are more easy, easily, to, so blue water, for example, yeah. as a, as a, 
uh, cologne. For yeah. most people, it does really have a blue quality to it. Interesting. Interesting. So, I didn't know but, about that. Huh. Yeah, it's there's something intriguing about maybe because it's it's our older sense and it's as you said, it's so impoverished that um, yeah. it, I I got into it because uh, when it comes to describing um, sounds or when it's describing sights, we use a very different vocabulary than when we describe yeah. smell. And so when we describe smell, mm. we, we draw from the visual a lot. So mm. uh, there's something quite intriguing there that uh, maybe yeah. that hints at how we process these things. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. It might have to do with the fact that that smell doesn't pass through the thalamus and just right. goes straight to the cortex. Yeah, um, there's something. Yeah, there's something really weird about it. Yeah. 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 And, there's yeah, not a whole lot of psychophysics on smell either because it's very yeah. hard to control uh, right. the amount of molecules you exactly yeah, get yeah, yeah, into yeah, yeah. your right, onto right. your receptor. So uh, it's it's a very it's another uh, research topic that seems underexplored. That's right. very fascinating to hear about. Yeah, um, right. So the other thing I wanted to uh, talk with you about it, to bring it back to this idea that mathematics um, might yes. be helpful to do that. It's interesting that um, I sense skepticism on your side. So. Maybe we yeah. can talk about integrated information theory a little bit. Yeah, in totally. Regard. So, to, yeah. Now the the intriguing proposition of IIT is that it it starts it, it circumvents some of the problems that you said in terms of how do we map from what I experience onto a mathematical structure by in a way taking these axioms that come mm -hmm. from the initial phenomenological observation or introspection that you yes. just say, well, it seems to be informative and it seems to have boundaries and, and, and then create a mathematical tool set that ironically is more about the physical substrate than yeah. conscious experience itself. And, yes. and then brings it back though and says, well, but if you, if you do all of this math then you, you end up getting this construct that might not just describe how much conscious you are, but also what type of consciousness you have. And so yes. what do you think about um, this notion? What, what, I, what I, again, is particularly what I'm interested in is that this seems, to, because it kind of comes from the other way around, it seems yeah. to get around maybe a lot of these problems of, well, how, how do I describe what I just experienced right now in terms of math? How do, how do I create this mapping? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I think my, my main issue with the IIT is, again, this philosophical issue, which is um, how do you go from the phenomenology to the physical? Mm -hmm. um, so as you said, IIT starts with these five phenomenological axioms about consciousness that are derived purely from first-person introspection. The consciousness exists, that it's intrinsic, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then it says, okay, there is a physical substrate of consciousness. Um, and how do you translate these phenomenological axioms into physical properties? And this to me, this is a, 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 a mapping that is impossible to define. Mm -hmm. um, for example, one of the axioms is that consciousness is unified. And then the, the, um, phys the corresponding physical postulate is that, you know, you have this cause effect structure. And if you were to partition that cause effect structure, then you would, uh, you know, then the information in the, some of the parts would be less than the information in the original whole. Hmm. Um, but why? <laughs> um, surely there are many other ways that you could, you know, um, physically encode something that is unified. Um, so it seems to me that like IIT is more of a theory about um, causal or perhaps information theoretic emergence than it is about consciousness per se. Uh, mm. And obviously consciousness shares a lot with, you know, emergence. Um, so it's unsurprising that, you know, we would expect to see four different states of consciousness that, that phi increases because, you know, you, you have some kind of an increase in emergent activity mm. that is underlying this. So I think that's a big confounding variable when it comes to testing IIT. Your question specifically was about like, um, like how how do we how do we get from like different objects and states of consciousness um, to like a mathematical formalism, right? right. And, and I think I, I think that's the other the, the other problem too, because you know, like, what do we want from a, a, a full theory of consciousness? Uh, is is what we want that for any subjective report that anybody could give me that I could uh, determine the mathematical or neurobiological signature of that experience? That again might just, in principle, be be very difficult, given the fact that people aren't trained to report on their subjective experience. So, mm -hmm. like for example, let's say that somebody says that they are feeling um, uh, more dissociated uh, in general, uh, or actually, let, let's let's make it even simpler, and, and let's say that somebody um, is just in general feeling sad. Um, well, okay, by sad, do they mean that they that you know, like their feeling of 
like arousal is low? Do they mean that they're feeling more dissociated? Um, um, is the sadness that they're experiencing more akin to grief and, and so on and so forth? Everybody has a different notion of what sadness is. IIT, you know, as a mathematical formalism, will have to say, you know, sadness means this, right? But sadness in the eyes of whom? In the eyes of the people who created IIT, um, you know, like mm. they, in order to create this mapping, you need to have introspected onto your mm. conscious experience in a way that you have a very crystal clear understanding of what sadness is. Mm -hmm. Other people won't have introspected on their experience in that way. Um, but furthermore, it's unclear if that person were to introspect on sadness, whether they would have an experience that's akin to yours. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think this, it's, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, I guess, is the issue. Um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's kind of like a many-to-many -many mapping where maybe the degrees of freedom go down as you get better at introspecting mm -hmm. into, <laughs> into mm -hmm. your experience. Yeah, but um, so actually, the, this really, in my mind, so you, I think on your blog, you, you also wrote a little bit about ontic structuric realism. Yes, yes. So uh, um, yeah. the, now, so that is, I think, a getting hot kind of topic in the philosophy of science, right? Totally, so that totally. basically the idea would be that uh, underneath it all, it's really about uh, relationships and so yes. how everything relates to everything else. And yes. so, yes. Um, and so here's where maybe I might, might make a jump, but are you familiar with Max Techmark's work and his ideas also that- Yes, yes. yes, yes, yes uh, so yes, basically yes. the idea is that- Some of his ideas at least, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not deeply familiar with it either, but my understanding is that he's saying, well, so why is it that math works so well in quantum yeah. physics, in relativity, in science in general? And so he's basically saying, well, that's maybe because the, the metaphysical reality is math-based or yes, yes, that math exactly. tops, taps into something that is almost the fabric behind space and time. Yeah. Um, it's it's the, the, the ultimate fabric of reality might be yeah. mathematics or what ma mathematics yeah. describes. Now, so for me, that's intriguing because if you, if you put all of this together, what we discussed, yeah. then it seems intriguing to think that if consciousness is part of all of this as well, that it should basically also be part of this mathematical something. Yes, <laughs> this absolutely, fabric. 100%. So you, you see that the same way, okay. I, I, I completely agree. And, and it's interesting you mentioned this because uh, Tegmark's ideas um, are something that I've talked about on my blog as well, actually. Um, and uh, and, and this, this relationship between you know, mathematics and the nature of reality is something I've, I've also been very interested in. Um, uh, you know, like Tegmark argues that mathematics is reality. Most physicists would just say that mathematics is a good tool for describing reality, but that it right. isn't reality and there are also there's a there's a whole very fascinating debate about um whether or not mathematics is invented or discovered that's that's related right. to all this um uh you know by virtue of the fact that consciousness happens in the universe um consciousness is is definitely mathematical and it's woven mm -hmm. up it, it's 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 um it's tied up with this you know you know grand mathematical fabric of reality as well yeah. um but uh you know there's this idea that you know of, that consciousness isn't merely mathematical by virtue of the trivial fact that it exists within, you know, the mathematical apparatus of reality, but mm. that 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 consciousness is what breathes fire into the mathematics of reality. And this I mm. love. This is an idea that I am uh, deeply interested in and committed to. Um, uh, I, I think, like you know, my, my views on consciousness have changed a lot over the years, but this this is one idea that I think I, I hold steadfast to in my belief of. Um, it's it's um. It's an idea that comes from, I, well, I don't know who originally it comes from, but Stephen Hawking, for example, has, has suggested that this might be the case, you know, mm. that like you have these laws of physics, but what is it that's breathing fire into the laws of physics? What's, you know, what's making the wheels turn, in other words, mm. you know, mm. what's, what's creating a universe for, um, for the laws of physics to describe? Mm -hmm. um, and the one candidate that we might potentially have for this is consciousness. Mm -hmm. Um, and this goes back to, you know, like the, the, um, the, uh, neutral or dual aspect monism of Bertrand Russell, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, who would, who would say that, um, yeah, mm -hmm. consciousness is the only thing that actually describes the intrinsic nature of reality. You have, you can have, uh, many, many equations for describing what an apple is, but at the end of the day, it's all just inert mathematical quote unquote dust until consciousness comes along and creates a thing for that mathematics to describe. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, uh, so I, 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 I think that's a really interesting idea. 
where does one place that though within the science of consciousness? Um, it's very hard to say, right? Because, and then you have this sort of difficult problem where it's like, okay, we're trying to come up with the mathematics of consciousness, but wait, hold on. Consciousness is what is what's breathing fire into the mathematics to begin with. So mm. what exactly are we doing here? <laughs> so uh, that, that's why it's uh, it's such a hard problem, I guess. Yeah. Can, can I probe a little deeper? So I think that what you said that there's different ways to look at it on a yeah. very simple level. I think there would be the, the Wignerian idea that consciousness leads to the wave function collapse. Yes. So that would lead to, I guess what Castrop is also a little bit more of the idealistic notion that yes. consciousness first, um, mind over matter kind of <clears throat> um, thinking. Right. Um, but there's also then this idea of that you mentioned mathematical uh, Platonism that you think that we're discovering mathematics and yes. then um, if you weave it together with what you said you could see mathematics maybe in a way that people did um, um, back when when they said it's practical theology that yeah. it's it's the, it's something um, well if you would say divine thinking yeah. or divine uh, thought that is uh, yeah. that seems to be behind all of that. It's almost taking the fact yes. that mathematics seems to be weaving our reality into uh, a fine-tuned universe argument for, yes. for something divine or something that this is created yeah. or something that there's beyond us. There's some, yeah. call it the simulation hypothesis, something yes. That, yes. that goes into uh, that kind of thinking. And But if I hear carefully enough, maybe you're taking yet a different approach where you're thinking, no, um, th there may be a primacy of things being mathematical in nature, mm -hmm. and then consciousness comes into that. And um, and it, so it's, it's almost like it's creating a space for within yes. consciousness is, is, yes. so is that maybe you can elaborate yeah. a little bit on your thinking? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think, I think, I think you've got it right there. Um, that, that, yeah, that, um, well, I think I think um, metaphysical questions about primacy become difficult, you know, which which mm. came first, the consciousness or the mathematics mm. that, you know, consciousness breeds fire into. Mm. Um, I guess you could say consciousness came first and then well, and then to the math. No, I don't think I actually don't think it makes sense to say one came before the other. I think that the two are sort of um, uh, mutually entangled with with each other um, mm. in that um, you need mathematics as a thing that consciousness is breathing fire into. Um, and then, uh, you need consciousness as, um, well, yeah, you need consciousness in order to breathe fire into the mathematics, but then you also need mathematics as a thing that consciousness is, you know, sort of animating, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that it's, it's, it's not a chicken or the egg situation, I guess. Either way, it seems to me that it's, it's exciting. It's an exciting notion given that we've, as, as humans, we've been thinking about this problem that, that consciousness yeah. seems to be so odd in the universe that there could be a solution and that that solution would fall into the, well, the beauty or simplicity or whatever you want to call it, that so much of what we discover about reality using the scientific apparatus boils down to some quote unquote simple math or something yes. that is within our grasp, even though yes, we're yes. so limited in our understanding. And so that th this might mean in other words, long story short, that yeah, we might be able to get to some kind of scientific understanding of consciousness. Yeah, and yeah. even though that might not solve the hard problem, but it would be ways from where we are right now, where it seems that it's maybe outside of science or it's right. this mysterious thing within of science. Yes. Yes. So yes. Um, I think that that might be to me why there's, so much energy and so much interest right now yeah. in this kind of uh, mathematics of consciousness. And it, it goes with what you said, that so. even if you say uh, a one-to-one -one mapping or many-to-one mapping or many-to-many yeah. -many mapping, math can deal with all of this, right? So it's like right, right. you're just ending up with these kind of uh, relationships again. <laughs> so yeah, if, yeah, if exactly. it's instead of turtles all the way down, it's just relationships all the way down. Math seems to yeah. be an ideal tool or certain parts of math seem to be ideal to kind of maybe get at that and, and deal with yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I definitely agree that, um, that that developing these mathematical tools is exciting. But again, if you think that consciousness is what's breathing fire into the mathematics, then how do you go about coming up with the mathematics of consciousness? Um, because mm -hmm. consciousness, yeah, I mean, I guess you're sort of placing consciousness in a way outside of mathematics by saying that. Mm. Um, um, and, uh, and so that would render the entire pursuit, um, ill-fated, I guess. Um, mm. but 
yeah, again, you know, it, it's, so there's that metaphysical question, but obviously there are these, you know, quantifiable changes that happen in your brain when you fall asleep and when you go under anesthesia mm -hmm. and when you experience psychedelics. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a very tough one. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. How do we, how do we know that we're um, philosophically uh, consistent in mm -hmm. our approach? Well, it, it, it was more than 10 years ago that I was at a, a meeting, a, con a consciousness meeting uh, for yeah. a scientific conference, and a, a colleague of mine came, to, came towards me and he said, aren't you excited? And that's about what? He said, we're, we're going we're gonna, to, there's going to be a solution in our lifetime. And yeah. <laughs> it yeah. seemed so crazy to me that I, yeah. I love optimism, but that seemed crazy. Yeah, yeah. But there seems to have been the last couple of years, so many breakthroughs, maybe even yeah. just in accepting some of these new research lines um, yes. that definitely I definitely have more hope than it's before I, I, there seemed to be to me some kind of stagnation in the field of yeah. consciousness a little bit yes and yeah. so there's a rekindling here and um in, in very exciting directions absolutely um, it's almost bizarre that the original thought maybe didn't quite go in that direction so yeah. that um there was this notion that we have to get at a scientific notion of consciousness and bind consciousness to brain but th the fact that this would require formalism and that maybe mm -hmm. we should look into that a little more uh, mm -hmm. that that seems to be a quite recent notion right so the one thing and that's maybe a little bit of a segue but if you have a, a couple more minutes of course yeah I would absolutely like to happy to so uh on your blog you also describe um um that there's something about empathy that yeah. might make it interesting for the research of consciousness and that yes uh I'm going to describe my own words and maybe you correct me, but so basically my, my understanding was that there's this fundamental notion that um, we talked about before that my consciousness and your consciousness seem to be, there seems to be no way that we can ever yes. get break out of it and communicate across. So yes, exactly. yes, I understand you have pain, but how do I know your pain is like my pain? And right. so it seems that you suggest that empathy might be something that is a way out or there's, it doesn't make it, the, the boundary some seems doesn't seem to be quite as hard. Yeah. Is that yeah? Right? Exactly, exactly. So so the fundamental problem for a theory of consciousness is this idea that consciousness is private. And I think pretty much everybody will will agree about this. Um, that um, there is no way for me to directly know what is happening inside of your consciousness. I only know what's happening inside of my consciousness. Um, and um, the the interesting thing about empathy is that it, it appears to take us beyond this notion that consciousness is private. Um, it appears to potentially make consciousness a shared thing. Mm. Now, um, in, in particular, there are some empaths who are very skilled at um, knowing the experiences of others. For example, mm. an empath might pass down the street and see a homeless person and immediately feel um, their suffering, you know, feel the, the pain in their stomach, for instance. Um, um, or alternatively, an empath might step into a room and immediately be able to assess the, the quote unquote vibe you know, um, uh, is, is, you know, like when people say the air in the room was stiff, you know, as soon as they walk in the room, what exactly are they picking up on? Now, there is this um, counter argument to this, which is a very valid one um, by Wittgenstein, apparently, um, which is that even if you uh, are able to directly channel the experience of somebody else, are you really experiencing them or are you just experiencing you experiencing them? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, like, isn't it always just your own consciousness? And, and that, that's a very valid um, counter argument. But, but the reason why I, I see this as valuable is that um, I, I think it, it could be a potential way around the Turing test because, you know, with the, the, the Turing test, you need to find some way of assessing whether or not somebody's conscious. And, and obviously the cookie cutter Turing test doesn't work because you could design some AI, which probably aren't sentient, but, you know, they can have they can hold a a uh, conversation with you um, and therefore appear to pass a Turing test. But if somehow you were able to introspect into somebody else's conscious experience and do this by way of empathy, then maybe you'd be able to know. Of course, you know uh, I, I don't think an empath would you know <laughs> necessarily be able to walk up to an AI, uh, try to empathize with mm -hmm. it, and then and then and then uh, uh, determine you know make a determination of whether or not they're the AI is conscious. Mm. Um, so this, this is more of a, a, a sort of thought experiment than anything. But um, yeah. It, I, it's interesting. Yeah. It, I thought you had it the other way around that we mm. could, instead of just doing a simple Turing test, push yeah. the AI towards seeing if the AI is uh, empathetic. And, and oh, see that's if, cool. 
that the yeah. AI has empathy. I think somebody yeah. mentioned at the conference even that if you if you try to do things with GP3, uh, yeah. GP3, then it yeah. really starts to stutter or gets in a loop. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so, uh, so yeah, if you think of it as both ways, then maybe it. But then you might ask, well, what about somebody who has pretty bad psychopathy and and lacks empathy in the first place? Would right, we then right. think that this person is not conscious? But, yeah. Uh, so your point is that you uh, would still be able to empathize with somebody like that. Um, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Again, this is this is this is mostly just a thought experiment, but um, everybody. So I, I guess this. Am I saying that 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 consciousness is about empathy? Um, not necessarily, um, but that I guess what I'm potentially proposing is that in order to determine whether or not something is conscious, um, somebody who um, is very highly cultivated in their empathy um, could try to empathize um, with that entity um, as a way of determining whether or not it's conscious. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if we yeah. not even already doing that, for example, by looking yeah. for consciousness in animals. Yeah, yeah, and, 100%. And so this is an interesting topic where to draw the line, but certainly yeah. uh, I think somebody who's very closely interacting with animals would argue yeah. that um, it's, it's almost this intuitive, empathetic notion that, that, yeah. you get, that you have no doubt that your dog is conscious. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting. I mean, there's, there's a clear difference between sympathy and empathy. So mm. like, you know, for example, you might see an animal suffering um, and then as a result, you know, you get sad or, you know, you feel this urge to help the animal or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then empathy is when you really step inside the shoes of another being mm -hmm. um, and, and you, you feel um, what it's like to be them for a moment. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I think definitely some people empathize with animals um, for sure. Um, but I think it's smaller than the number of people who sympathize with animals. Mm, interesting. Well, it's, I, I find it an interesting point in that I've been part in conversations where people yeah. bring up the privacy of consciousness and how that yes. may be something that you don't get around. And if you just drop the word empathy, uh, everybody seems to stop their tracks and, and, and think a little bit. So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. It's interesting that there is already, that we already might have in our everyday language or experience something that seems to, to get around that, that fundamental yes. problem. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, potentially, potentially. But again, potentially. it's it's, it's, un it's unclear whether or not still what you experience when you empathize with somebody else is just your own experience or it's actually their experience. You know. Yeah, and so the the daydreaming part of me thinks, well, isn't so? It, let's say, what, couldn't we call it, let's say, a projection of their consciousness mm -hmm. into my consciousness? And then, yeah, once we have that, so now we're dealing in the realm of. Yeah mathematics in a way again yeah, so exactly, if i yeah. would know that kind of projection function then i could in a way recreate maybe that kind of consciousness um, right 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 yeah at least yeah that's very interesting yeah yeah i like that idea um yeah um i mean there are mirror neurons in the brain um mm. um which um you know are at least responsible for things like imitation mm -hmm. um and I don't know the literature connecting that to empathy. Mm. Um, so there, there is some kind of neuro, neurobiological mechanism for sure. Um, mm. Can you show that it's a, a projection? It's a, it's a very interesting question. We do know definitely that like interpersonal social behavior results in synchronization between yeah. brain waves, and that's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, do you think that empathy is something that can be learned or trained or expanded on? Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, are all people capable of developing empathy? Uh, I don't know, but I think it's definitely something you can train in yourself. Uh, for example, like loving kindness is um, is is a branch of, of meditation, mm. um, and um, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it 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 really just like centers around extending wishes of well being to um, uh, first yourself uh, and then to all sentient creatures. Um, um, that's, I guess, more about compassion than empathy, you know, the extending mm. of all wishes rather than, than mm. putting yourself in the shoes of another person. And consciousness mm. and empathy and compassion and empathy are not the same thing, mm. but um, they are certainly interrelated. Ah, good point. Interesting. Now, since we're kind of circled back to the beginning, yeah. I feel now more comfortable maybe asking this, but so there is this idea that 
maybe our consciousness is just tapping into yeah. a giant consciousness that in totally. a way we're all a part of. Yes. But if that's the case, why would it be that it's so private and so isolated? Why would why is why would I have to chemically alter my brain yeah. to maybe tap into the, it's the a, common consciousness? Right, right, right. It's it's a it's a great question. It's a great question. And this is this is another thing that I think my I, I I hold relatively steadfast in my belief of is that that um conscious if I if I had to speculate about the nature of consciousness, this is pure speculation, it would be very closely aligned with um something that a friend of mine, um, Chelsea Pisano, once told me, which is that consciousness is sort of like this universal field and your brain is an antenna for tapping into it. Um, and, uh, and there is such a thing as a consciousness that is beyond you. Um, and I guess what somebody like, for example, Rupert Spira would say is that, that yes, you are always actually connected to it. It's just that, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's just that your mind, A, forgets about it, and B, your ego dominates um, your mm -hmm. stream of consciousness too much for you to actually be able to recognize your connection to this, you know, universal interconnected consciousness. Mm -hmm. But really, if you were to quiet down the ego, um, and if you were to just me merely surrender to the universe, um, then this is something that you'd experience. Uh, and I, you know, I, I actually think that there is something there as, as, as wild and as, you know, deeply unscientific as, as it is. And that you're never going to convince somebody to do an experiment on this until there's a very clear cut protocol. But um, that that you know um, that you can get beyond the privacy of conscious experience um, if you were to um, uh, tap into the uh, non-dual um, but fundamental um, uh, uh, aspect of your awareness, which is um, um, which is connected to all things. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, there's there's no protocol for doing that in three hours in an fMRI scanner yet. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. So maybe that's a good to point to to end this on. So um, yeah, thanks so absolutely. very much for this um, uh, really wonderful discussion. And so I'll link all of your uh, blog and, and other things below. Thanks so much. Anybody who is interested. And so uh, anything else you would uh, anybody like to uh, lead to? Um, no. Uh, I, yeah. Thank you very much for having me. Well, thanks again, likewise. And thank you, Alex. Uh, uh, talk to you soon. Yeah, absolutely.